I want welcome to everybody on the sim, and I want to welcome everyone who may well be listening as well uh, on the 2D web, as we call it here in Second Life. Uh, if that's uh, your uh, situation, if you're listening uh, via your internet browser and you're not in Second Life, uh, let me give you just a little background information here. This is a, a, a platform of a virtual interactive community. Now, unlike most virtual worlds today, I uh, think uh, MMOs, massively multiplayer online games like World of Warcraft or whatnot, here, uh, all of the content that uh, people can interact with and experience uh, is not created by the company who owns Second Life. It's created by the residents of Second Life. SL is a user-generated content environment, quite simply a world created by the people within it. Uh, some use it to create and sell virtual products, some for role-play game, some use it for educational and creative ends, and some, like the Science Fiction Alliance, use it to relay. In the 2013 season so far, relayers in Second Life have come together in record numbers and have raised, since March, 300,000 U.S. dollars. Over 200 teams made up of over 3,000 people from across the planet have been creating and hosting events, auctions, music performances, all to raise money for the vision of the American Cancer Society, a world, a future without cancer. Uh, if you're with us in world today, there are, is a Relay for Life kiosk here on the stage beside me. Uh, if you're listening in on the web, there's a website that I'd ask you to take a look at, and that is relayforlife.org slash secondlife. Uh, you'll see a Donate Now button on that page. That'll take you to a secure site on the Relay for Life website where you can make a donation. So I, I want to say, if you, if you hear something on the broadcast today that uh, you appreciate or that moves you, touches you in any way, then I want to start by thanking you for being generous in support of a cause that is moving us closer and closer to that goal, the, uh, the end of cancer. Like all of the greatest of epic tales, Relay is about what each of us can do individually, and it's about what we can do when we come together to form alliances to reach for the stars. And, speaking of stars, <laughs> I, am, <laughs> I am very, very pleased to welcome today's special guest. 20 years ago, he became part of television, and in particular, sci-fi television history. Babylon 5 was and remains innovative and daring. The relevance of its major themes grows, it would seem, every time you turn on the nightly news. In story and in character, the series was complex, imaginative, and at times painfully honest. It takes craft to pull that off. It takes craftsmanship. It takes actors, like our guest, my friend Peter Jurisic, who so masterfully essayed the role of Londo Malari on Babylon 5. Peter, hello and welcome. Scott, what a nice introduction. Thank you so much. You're so generous in your words. It's uh, it's so nice for me to be uh, to be a part of this today. Uh, I wanted to start, if I could, by thanking Science Fiction Alliance. Of course, thanking you, Scott Xander Green, and um, all the people who put this together. I get, in particular, Kurt Wingtips and uh, Ms. Fall. If you'll help me with her first name, Ariadne. Ariadne, thank you, uh, who I heard is in a, uh, a vision in, in blue today. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> thank you both for uh, putting this together. Uh, I'm on this beautiful set, and, uh, you know, uh, it looks like some grand Centauri Opera House to me, although you won't be hearing Centauri Opera. They don't have a budget that's big enough to allow me to get up and sing. So <laughs> be hearing Centauri Opera. Uh, but it looks uh, so gorgeous, and uh, our thanks to uh, Nightshade Sixpence for that. It's a beautiful set. Thank you. Peter. Anyway, Scott, thank you for having me, and uh, so uh, uh, excited to field questions and to help raise money for this terrific cause. Peter is being able to see what we're, he's not with us in avatar form here in Second Life, but we are doing a share screen with Peter so that he can see what, uh, uh, what the set is here, and uh, we'll be fielding some questions here from the audience. So if you want to um, instant message, um, I would sit, ask Ariadne, who's here in the house, uh, Ariadne, if you would just ask uh, if anyone has questions, if they would uh, pass those along to you and you can pass them to me and I am uh, just to keep my, um, I am tend to lag my system out. So uh, just pass along your questions to Ariadne. She'll pass them to me. Her name Ariadne Fall. She's here in-house with us today. Uh, we have been uh, getting some questions all afternoon long, and Peter, we're going to uh, get some questions from our audience. We're going to talk about Babylon 5, obviously, but, you know, for as long as I've known you, the thing that I get most geeky fanboy about is actually an earlier feature film you worked on 
a film that well had a wee bit to do, let's say, with forming not just our idea about sci-fi, but about virtual worlds in particular. Tron really redefined how movies are made and how we see the future. Pete, when you were shooting Tron, did you have an inkling that it would have such far-reaching effects? Uh, we really didn't, Scott. You know, uh, the uh, the vision, the, the the person with uh, the who carried the vision for all of us was Steve Lisberger, who was the director and the creator. And um, part of his job, since it was so early on in the production of this uh, this kind of movie making, was uh, for him to um, to lock in that vision, if you will, and hold that up for us to look at. It was the, uh, you know, when you in a practical sense, it was the first time, for instance, I had ever seen storyboarding done. Hmm. Storyboarding, of course, is used in all feature work now. It's hard to imagine a production that doesn't have some element of CGI, uh, digital enhancement, even uh, films that you don't think of necessarily as fantasy or science fiction. Still, uh, the, the, the digital uh, revolution has really reached in and touched every aspect of filmmaking at this point, hasn't it? It has, and 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 this was it was brand new when we when we walked onto the set of Tron, and there were these big empty sets, uh, absolutely all everything was black, and uh, we were all uh, uh, everything was being perfectly clean, and the only thing uh, we saw were the storyboards and Steve's vision. So he really had the vision. We didn't. We followed him, and uh, the work was very childlike in the sense that he would tell us what the scene was and show us in storyboard what ultimately it would look like, and then we, we, we would play at it. But he was really our leader, and all kudos go to him. Steve Lisberger, um, you know, I don't think he gets enough credit for uh, how groundbreaking his work was. Um, Pete, um, here we are now today sharing this conversation with an audience uh, from around the world via a virtual world. Uh, it's, it's interesting, in a, in a sense, kind of full circle here, isn't it? It really is, isn't it? That uh, I mean, uh, somewhere I guess uh, you know Steve must be really smiling to think that uh, his visions and his dreams, in a sense, have come true. Um, it's it, yeah, it really is wonderful. Even when we when we got to the screening and we had the representation of the actual movie to look at, it was still something that was lost on a lot of people, you know, to understand. And uh, yeah, it really is something. Uh, it was, a, it was a wonderful experience as an actor, and I was so happy to be a part of it. And there was such an element of trust on all of our parts just to uh, walk kind of blindly ahead into the creative process. It was great. I remember Jeff talking to uh, all of us about that, hmm. to Jeff Bridges saying, good, we may not, uh, we may not uh, understand every aspect the way an actor likes to research a role and understand and get all the underpinnings put together. He said we may not have that. But in the way uh, good movies and good TV are done, there is an element of uh, trust that the actor has to have. And um, Jeff uh, really encouraged us to, to remember that and push forward and to embrace that and not be afraid. It was great. You had to do some uh, pretty physical stuff in, in, that, uh, in that wonderful scene. You play the accounting subroutine who, uh, <laughs> who Jeff is forced to... Uh, to, to battle not knowing what the stakes are, and then, gosh, of all people, David Warner gave you a big thumbs down, and down you went indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I know. The, the most physical aspect, the ring game was very difficult, but just getting into the white tights was uh, <laughs> as physical as you want to get. You still uh, uh, still have those in your uh, wardrobe, do you? Oh, oh, oh absolutely. Uh, you know, and I, just, just every once in a while, I slip into them, just take a drive around the neighborhood, <laughs> all in white tights. <laughs> I always have said the only people who can wear white uh, white tights head to foot are like Romanian gymnasts, and uh, I particularly was uh, do not have the body type for white tights. I, I look uh, sort of I, I always describe it as the Hoover Dam. So, uh, <laughs> well, Tron, uh, you mentioned Jeff Bridges, obviously, but uh, yeah. Tron also found you working with um, an actor that you'd work with again on Babylon 5. It really is kind of a small industry in, in some ways, isn't it, Peter? Well, it is. Hollywood is a small town. It, uh, sometimes it, it feels, especially if you're a young artist or a young actor trying to kind of break down the doors and get in, that uh, it feels monolithic and where, how, do you, how do you enter into this? community but when you do get in and you get your break and uh, people with persistent and persistence and talent you know you just got to hang in there you'll get your moment and 
uh, when you do break in, you find a relatively small community. That's right. Bruce Boxleitner was somebody who he came to Hollywood at the same time. We were exactly the same age. And uh, so we knew each other kind of, quote, around town, just as two actors. Um, so when we found ourselves on Tron together and then later on his show, Scarecrow and Mrs. King and on Babylon 5, there was something that's not that all that surprising about it. It's obviously easier to work with someone a second time than a first time, uh, but uh, there's also the thrill of getting to work with someone that you've really admired and uh, you find yourself on a set and you think, well, I just can't believe where I'm at. Um, of all the projects you've done, Pete, just looking back, um, just moments that you look back and think, well, I cannot believe I got to be in this you know, uh, project with this person. Well, you know, uh, if you're asking that as a direct question, Scott, you know, I remember the moments that I felt most. I mean, I did a, a television movie with Burt Lancaster, and Burt Lancaster, for me, uh, is really a, a, a movie icon of the 20th century. You know, uh, movie making is a relatively uh, new medium, but he is one of the giants. So when I found myself on stage with him on a on a on a set, and um, you know, having a number of scenes together, and he and I laughing, creating, and being together, it was a really a real thrill for me. And you know, so. Uh, I, I put uh, I put him up there. And of course, you know, Jeff Bridges is a different, he wasn't a giant star then, but, uh, you know, one of the first things Jeff said is, hey, you want to go, let's, let's go sit down and play some guitars together and hang out. Mm. And he had his way. And to have people like that who are kind of iconic take you in and just say, look, we're just going to be friends and create and work together is, uh, you know, it's a real thrill. It really is. I, I have, I have so many people in my career that go into that category, but, you know, that, Certainly, Bert popped to mind. Well, there's certainly a lot of people that I know personally who would uh, add uh, the opportunity to work with you uh, on their list of uh, m most satisfying creative moments, and I count myself among those. Uh, I want to quickly make mention to Pete of a few other people who we should give thanks to today. Uh, of course, this event is sponsored by the IFT Sci-Fi Alliance. They organize and run this convention, but it's done with major support from a number of in-world Second Life groups. Ambrosia Coalition is a big social fundraiser. Um, the LSI, Pax Phobos, USS Dover, Araxis, Shiny Brand, Novatech, and the Babylon 5 Roleplay Group in Second Life who helped found the convention and are really one of the longest running roleplay stories here in SL. They're also celebrating their fifth year anniversary this year as Babylon 5 celebrates its 20th so a big thank you to all of those groups and also to NS6, another sponsor of the event who contributed, among other things, this very, very cool steampunk theater that we're broadcasting from today. So we want to take a moment to thank uh, the founders of the feast before we uh, get into the Babylon Town questions for our guest, Peter Joseph, the third London um, and I want to start those with an audience question, if I can. Um, uh, Peter, uh, Louise Shawbridge here in the house asks, First, how did you manage to get the role of uh, the Centauri Ambassador to Babylon 5? Did you audition, or um, was there a previous connection to someone uh, connected with the story that uh, brought you in for that specifically? Well, if I can, just uh, to, uh, let me start here by saying that uh, we had previously mentioned Tron, and Tron was a project that came about just by people meeting. Uh, uh, I, I met Steve at a party. Uh, he had come and seen the producer that he was working with had come and seen a play that I was doing. So that was all just personal relationships. And eventually, uh, as amazing as it might sound now, you know, Steve said, hey, I'm going to be doing a movie over at Disney. You know, you like to be in it. And, uh, and so it was as simple as that. By the time Babylon came along, I was already uh, an established character actor in Hollywood. I'd worked in a number of um, uh, series as a, as a regular and as a recurring character and had already established. So by then I was working through much more traditional lines and those traditional lines were of course uh, um, through casting directors and people, go, people going through my agent. In particular and specifically Babylon 5 rolled up and at the end of uh, pilot season which was traditionally in March uh, in April or February, March there would be a hiatus and um, the script to Babylon 5 came right after that. It came in May. And for me, um, it came through my agent. And I read it. I loved the script from the very, very beginning. 
And my wife, Barbara, reminds me that I read it and walked back into the house and said, oh, definitely, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. um, coincidentally, uh, Andreas Consulis had the exact same reaction. His uh, wife at the time mentioned, his girlfriend at the time mentioned that he did the same thing, read it and said, I want to be in it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it was early in the season, as I said, right after pilot. So the idea of getting a job and getting a jump on your year was a great thing. But the script just grabbed us um, both. Um, we had the same agent. So, um, you know, the script came down that way. We were both offered to read it. We read the roles that they asked. And, um, and then we had to go and audition. Yeah, we did go and audition. What's quite curious, and Scott, uh, having spent time in the professional uh, world, knows what a rarity this is, but, you know, they brought in lots and lots of actors for these uh, TV movies called Babylon 5 they were going to do, or this TV movie, and Andreas and I were uh, scheduled back-to-back. -back. Um, so, you know, I had a, a, a 210 slot on that Tuesday afternoon, and the actor that followed me was Andreas Katsoulis at, like, 215 or 220. <laughs> Isn't that amazing, Scott? Incredible. I mean that is incredible just by chance that we that the two people ended up in it auditioned back to back because there probably were like literally tens or hundreds of people who auditioned but hmm. and um so yeah i auditioned for it there were a series of callbacks and uh i had already um agreed to a, a job in new york and so i couldn't go to callback so i i always find that an, an interesting piece of trivia that when they asked me to go to callbacks, I wasn't available, so I only read one time for them. And the rest is television history, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> or as they say, a lucky break. <laughs> Good thing I didn't go to that second callback and blow it, right? <laughs> Um, for uh, some people say that you, a callback is as good as getting offered the, jo the job, uh, meaning if they brought you back in for a second read, they're basically saying at that point, okay, you could do it. You're one of five guys who could do it. We're just trying to get the, the chemistry right here. Is that about right, Pete? That's about it. That's, that's really true. That's certainly what I teach these days when I, when I talk about auditioning. Yeah, call, when, you, when, you, when you make it to callback, you've done, really done your work. Uh, as much as you can do, yeah. and they're going to sort it out from there. I want to talk more about the process of creating a, a mem memorable and unique character, and, and certainly Londo Malari fits uh, those descriptors. Uh, you began in, in some ways as a supporting role, but it evolved to become one of the most significant characters to the main arcs, story arcs of the series. You, you took him from a comic relief role, really, to a major driver of some of the series' most dramatic themes certainly one of the most, com most complex. Talk about that a bit, Pete, how that evolved over time for you. Did you see it coming in the scripts? Was that something you and Joe talked about? Uh, did you talk as a cast about where things were going in general? Well, I can talk specifically about that, uh, but I'd like to, if I could, Scott, start with uh, when, when uh, uh, taking a character like this, who's uh, as theatrical as he is, for lack of a better word, um, you know, the, the process started for me because I was trained in the theater by building um, a clear understanding of who he was emotionally or at least grab a point of view and a perspective that I could hang on to about who this person was. And then uh, when I felt like I had that and I felt like, you know, I grasped that right away when I said that I read the script and related to him right away and Andrea said the same thing, that's what happens once in a while. You read a script and you say... I get this character. I understand uh, who he is inside. For me, I love where Londo was placed uh, in that pilot. He was, as you said, a comedic character, but he had uh, really grave and sad and tragic uh, overtones to him. He was a drunk. Um, he was despondent. About, he was stuck in a corner. That's what, how I always describe it. He was a man pushed into a corner. And I understood that about him emotionally. Then I could lay on, because I, I, I learned my craft through the theater, then I started to lay on uh, the exterior work and said, how does he sound and how does he move? Uh, but always uh, staying very much connected to that inner pr uh, point of view. How much of the internal man was driven by the external elements of it, certainly the uh, wardrobe uh, the hair deserves a Wikipedia page all, all by itself. 
uh, and then there's the accent. Um, how much of what was going on for you internally was being driven by some of those, you know, really strong external physical um, aspects of the character? Of course, they all they all start back bouncing like like, like a lot of creative decisions. There's a you know a, 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 a explosion of energy, a synergy that starts to happen, and they start to. Uh, bounce back and forth. What what's better than a guy who's dressed beautifully and uh, with all his medals on his chest, who's a complete loser, and, and drinking in a bar? I mean, that was great. Uh, you know, here's a guy with this uh, incredible uh, uh, cow on his head, this 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 beautiful hairdo, who uh, who's really just a mess in his life. So I loved all that, and that all sort of bounced one one bounced against the other. And I, yes, Scott. I played into that and tried to play, uh, you know, uh, uh, make that part of the playing of the character. As I said, never leaving the perspective of who I understood where he was. He was a character who uh, had a giant ego, but he had, as I said, been pushed into a corner and had to figure out how he was going to get out of that corner. And the, the, the things like his hair and how he was dressed were things that were being pushed towards me. And not every, not all of them were embraced. You know, the joke about the hair, of course, is that it was a joke. That in the drawings that they showed us at the audition, because we had uh, renderings, the, the Londo had a very small little, kind of like the way the Emperor Kataja, really small hair, and that that it ended up being much taller. That he always had this long flowing wig, uh, not wig, uh, cape, that he wore. And I didn't like that cape. I didn't feel like it worked for him. It didn't allow me. It covered up too much of the physicality of him. So some things were rejected, but and some things added on, like the length of his hair. But uh, it, there's an energy that goes on, as you know, Scott, between uh, the creation of a character and uh, the elements that, uh, especially in ensemble work like theater and, I mean, uh, TV and film, mm. that the other people are pushing in your direction and adding to your, to your selection. It's great. Question here from um, uh, from uh, one of the convention organizers, actually, Ariadne Fall. Um, she agrees that uh, Londo is, over the course of the series, one of the most uh, widest ranging emotional stories, and uh, she thanks you for uh, the, this impressive performance as well. And she wonders, which was there a particularly emotionally challenging scene for you to play? You had a lot of <laughs> pretty um, heavy emotional scenes over the course of that series. Well, you know what? There, are the, e e each aspect of uh, Londo had their own, its own, his own emotional challenges. Londo, as I said, started out trying to figure out his way out of a corner, and uh, 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 you know, Mr. Morden's entrance into the story and that seduction was a really interesting thing for me to play. All of them uh, call for uh, you know different stuff uh, inside you as the uh, as the actor, as the creator, to to push forward, but. Um, you know, I, I like anybody else have uh, you know, plenty of plenty of mistakes and bad sides to who I am to to feed that <laughs> character, right? So, the the initial stuff was um, getting baited and uh, finding a way out, and and then uh, the power started to to come about uh, happen. So that those were emotionally challenging uh, scenes for him to start to embrace the power and then feel what the double-edged sword of that was like. And uh, probably the, uh, you know, they, they, they had worked in a love story for him. He was a guy who didn't have uh, any real love in his life and never really loved anything except his country and, uh, and his land. So that was an interesting part of the uh, challenge mm -hmm. emotionally for me to play. But... Uh, the final or one of the final turns JMS offered was the tragic aspect of the character. And um, I would say that was the most uh, emotionally, the most difficult stuff to play, where a character uh, has made a series of mistakes, usually important and big stuff, and, uh, and then understands those mistakes and, um, and has to live with those and play those. I guess that'd be the hardest stuff to do in life, too. All of us are up for a challenge. All of us are up for a, uh, you know, a, a race up the hill. But the race down the hill after you've made mistakes can be a little more challenging, huh? Certainly. And um, it's certainly where the real um, meat on the bone to be found in any character uh, is in any, whether it's 
theater, film, television, what have you, uh, you're talking a lot about um, contradictions, contrasts, uh, and, and those who really do drive most drama, whether you're talking about it on the level of the character or on the level of the script as a whole. Absolutely. You know, the, the contrast is, uh, you know, that's, that's what made Londo such a, a, a joy to play, is that uh, Joe never settled for uh, the next week following up with the same thing that he had done the week before. It's so much easier in terms of writing to just keep a character in one spot and leave the character in that spot. This is the good guy. This is the bad guy. This is the kind doctor. This is the, uh, you know, the seducing neighbor. Mm -hmm. it, it's much easier to write that. Joe would, uh, one episode, uh, Londo was dealing with deep ethical questions about blowing up a planet and killing uh, tens of thousands of people. And then the next episode, he was killing a bug in, <laughs> in his apartment. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. in his quarters, and uh, and Joe was uh, uh, realized that by you know putting those contrasting that kind kind of contrasting worked up, it would really give us in real insight into the facets and who this of this who this guy was. It's a fascinating question, and I want to thank actually that question came from Lilith Hapmush here in the audience. So thank you very much, Lilith, for that question. Remind you that you're listening to an interview with Peter Jurisic of Babylon 5. We're here at the SFA Spring Convention on behalf of Relay for Life. And there's a kiosk here to the side of the stage where uh, I'm seated. And uh, if you will, click on that and just throw a few of those Linden dollars in there. Of course, those are real dollars going to the uh, real cause of supporting the American Cancer Society and Relay for Life. Uh, 3,400 uh, Linden dollars already donated here during this time, and um, if I'm doing the math right, that's a little over 20 bucks or so. Thank you very much for everybody who's making a contribution. Keep that going on. If you're listening on the web, you can go to relayforlife.org slash secondlife and click on Donate Now. That'll take you to a secure page on the Relay for Life website where you can donate by credit card, give what you can, and know that you're doing so uh, in support of a, uh, a really tremendous cause and one that is um, alive and well and thriving in this virtual world of Second Life. Peter. Scott, it's a cause that feels uh, to, really personal to me, uh, to so many people. So I'd like to just uh, say, please, uh, it would mean a great deal to me. I'm so glad I'm, uh, you know, I've been given this opportunity to connect with fans and answer questions and, um, you know, uh, uh, talk about Babylon 5 or any other aspect of uh, my work, but it would mean so much that you support support the real life cause here. Uh, like uh, Scott said, if you're listening not in Second Life, you can go to reallifeforlife.org slash Second Life and donate there, or just go over to the kiosk if you're uh, with us and, and click on it and, and uh, make a donation. It's, uh, it's a great thing the Science Fiction Alliance has done here. Uh, it's really fun to do, but it's going to really be wonderful if we can put some dollars together for a, a cause that's uh, important to all of us. As you said, Scott, and I love the idea, together uh, what we can do is really what's amazing. So I, I, I like to encourage you to join us and be part of this cause and uh, you know, uh, click on that kiosk or go to relayforlife.org slash second life and be a part of this with us it's a great thing and pete as you uh, as you make that appeal just uh, you should know that uh, the the kiosk is literally just humming along here now uh, probably doubled that amount here in just a matter of a few seconds so thank you, uh, thank you. Thank you all thank you very much for that and uh, peter i know this is uh, a cause that is dear to you uh, for a, a number of reasons and one of the biggest has got to be the the fact that uh, in a show that's so much about character, that's so much about um, more so than, than most science fiction, let's be honest, that is so character driven, uh, no, uh, in, in a story of just incredibly complex and uh, in times painful relationships, none are more complex, none mo more um, emotionally wrenching than the relationship between Londo as a representative of his people and the character Jakar, a representative of the Narn. And uh, the history there between the two peoples being represented is a, a, a difficult, challenging one, to say the least. Uh, that role was essayed so brilliantly by a gentleman whose name you mentioned earlier, Andreas Katsoulis. 
uh, he played your car so brilliantly and I know became really quite a good friend to you. Um, this relationship dealt with issues of racism, oppression, and ultimately redemption. Uh, Andreas passed away uh, from lung cancer in 2006. Pete, I've got to believe that's a big part of why you were eager to be part of this panel today in support of Relay for Life. It certainly is, uh, Scott. You know, I, I, uh, can cancer is a great cause for all of us to work towards a cancer-free world, as you said. But it's uh, it's it, it, it's it's driven by the, you know the individual people in our lives who we've, who where cancer has touched us, all of us. Everybody has it. I lost my my dear mother-in-law, great uh, person to to lung cancer. And yes, Andreas is somebody who we lost to cancer. Uh, you know, when you talked about the uh, the people I was most awed to work with, and I told you I wasn't being uh, flip when I said, oh, there are many in my career. Uh, uh, Andreas was one of those people. Andreas came to Babylon 5 with already a uh, absolutely uh, stellar career. He had worked with Peter Brook in some of the highest levels of theater that you could possibly work for. You, you people know his work. Um, I know his television film work probably better than I do, but like the one-armed man, that really unsettling mm -hmm. performance of who that character was. He was the master actor, Andreas, you know. What were you going to say, Scott? Were you going to jump in there that for a minute? That was the fugitive, wasn't it? The yeah, the fugitive, that's right. The one-armed man, the fugitive. He, he, uh, he was a wonderful actor, and uh, he understood in the last uh, years year or so of his life that uh, his life was going to be cut short and when I uh, communicate with his uh, family his daughter once in a while uh, she and I will communicate still we realized that that was taken from us um, and um, you know Andreas is a person who loved uh, cigarettes and somehow tied that to his creative process um, and uh, was not able to uh, get away from it but today uh, doing uh, the work that we're doing t today to try to raise some money for the American Cancer Society and Relay for Life it feels so important because it would be a wonderful world to have Andreas Katsoulis around to sit on, in on this discussion. A great uh, actor, a very funny person, um, n not at all the person that you might imagine watching Jakar. Uh, he just a uh, 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 a real regular guy in every sense of the word, and yet so extraordinary and not regular in his work. So, well, uh, you and he both were, uh, he perhaps more so than you, were really uh, weighted down with a lot of application, a lot of prosthetics there. Uh, what he was doing really does uh, border what we would call mask work, I suppose, in theater, doesn't it? Yeah, and when I talked about how I'm putting a character together, Andreas, I know, would say this. You know, he, he understood the character uh, uh, when he read him and, he, and understood the inside of the makeup, the character, of the makeup of the character so well that the outside of the character became just that. It becomes kind of a mask or something that um, is reflective, but it's mostly reflective of what's going inside. Andreas had his full face and head cover. They put a number of people in that Narn makeup, and those and actors couldn't take it. And, mm -hmm. you know, actors will work under any circumstances <laughs> just to get a job. <laughs> so, you know, it's a big thing when an actor will say, no, I don't want to do this. Get me out of here. It was a, it could be very claustrophobic, and it was very difficult work, and Andreas is the soul and heart of the character, the uh, the wisdom, the um, the life of the character shown through that makeup, no question about it, Scott, through his eyes. He was an extraordinary actor and great guy. Let's talk a bit more about that storyline uh, between uh, Londo's and uh, Jakar's relationship, the, the complexity of the cultural history there that that represents, and it really does get into some pretty serious thematic areas, doesn't it? Well, it really does, and as you said, it's reflective of our times. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, rec I'm recalling a, a, a lyric uh, that um, one of my favorite uh, singers, Joni Mitchell, writes about, what are we going to do when the slaves are gone? Mm. And uh, in truth of fact, as we know in our world, the slaves are never gone. Uh, there's always uh, people enslaving the next. There's always an, a, a group enslaving, and there's a group of slaves. And um, that struggle that the Narns were under to be free, uh, to um, uh, the, 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 
the the power that Londo was seduced with and the Centauri could not put down. Um, those those are classic themes, and they are themes that need to be explored because they're part of the world that we live in. We all know that. Um, that's really what uh, goes on in the geopolitical uh, systems of our world, you know? Sci-fi is in a unique position to make comments about things like that, isn't it, in a, in a way that perhaps gets it uh, through the door of our normal defenses to talk about some of these some of these issues and themes. You know, um, the you know, uh, art, that, that's the beautiful thing about art, and that's why I feel so lucky to be a piece of the show and to, to represent Joe's words, and but all art can can do that. Uh, I saw t this morning on television a man who was taking pictures of uh, uh, products in Walmart, and, and it was sort of a, a Andy Warhol-esque pictures, a blurred pictures of, you know, thousands of bags of chips, uh, of potato chips and Tostitos and products we know. And um, he said, listen, I go, I went about this work with no political intent at all, but the audience interprets it and takes what they read, what they want from it. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's true in in, uh, in in Babylon Five and in all good art, I think, or all good stories, that uh, we as an audience get to um, to ex to uh, expand and understand better the subtext, the connotations, uh, uh, take the work and relate it to our own lives in a real way. Peter Jurisic talking about uh, the work on Babylon 5. The show ran for five seasons. There were a few follow-up miniseries. It spun off novels, games, comic books, continues to rate very highly in anybody who's anybody's list of the best sci-fi series in TV history. You and most of the other um, cast members uh, from the show continue to make regular appearances at conventions around the world, most recently at a special 20th anniversary reunion. I think that was in Phoenix, Arizona, wasn't it, just recently? It certainly was, and it was certainly fun, I'll tell you. Other than having to face what we the, the 20 years of age that we've all, uh, you know, that, 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 that we try to avoid, but we can't, um, it was really fun to see all these people again. You know, uh, I don't live on the West Coast anymore, so I don't see them very much, but to be able to sit at a dinner and laugh with Stephen first and um, riff away on the Londo Veer relationship one more time was uh, was really a joy for me to to be around uh, Bill Mooney and uh, it, he's such a creative guy and his music and how he thinks about the world. Mira Furlan is, um, you know, just a lovely, lovely, creative. Um, emotional person that uh, I've missed spending time with. So when I go to these conventions, and I don't go very often, I went to this one in Phoenix, and I guess the year before I went to one in um, uh, the UK, where we have a really strong fan base there. Um, you know, for me, it's not only about uh, meeting the fans, but it's also about seeing the people I worked with all those years. Mm. And the 20th anniversary was really special because JMS was there. And uh, it's his baby, you know. I've never been shy to say that. The great maker. Uh, and he's the great maker, exactly. And and all these characters came out of his head, and that's the way, uh, you know. That that's the way it really is in in uh, in in theater and uh, TV and film. It's always that old adage, you know. If it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage, mm -hmm. right, Scott? And that's, that's right. just true. You, you have to have a great script. So to have him, uh, JMS, there in Phoenix was really great. Certainly, it's driven by a lot of great performances, but no doubt about it, uh, this thing continues to roll on and, and find uh, new audiences um, all the time now. I mean, we, we used, used to be do these things, they go flying out into the ether, and that was that. Uh, but uh, today, it's so easy to be able to uh, bring old, uh, older extant material to a new audience every day of the week. I, I want to get in one uh, question here from an audience, kind of connects to this. Cool Luke with us in the house wants to know, when is the next B5 album coming out? Well, we, you know, we did the, the initial one um, right after the series ended, and uh, because we lost, uh, I guess, uh, four... Rick Biggs and Andreas Katsoulis and uh, Tim Schote, and then when Michael O'Hare died, uh, Bill decided to write two more songs, and so we redid those, and we redid those in the last six or eight months. And on the new album, those two new songs are on there. They're both tributes to those people. They're both about losing people. They're both about moving on. 
So, but I don't know that there'll ever be another B5 album, partly because, uh, as I said, I'm not. I had a good friend here in town help me with the recording here, but they, they had to sort of match. It would be great to do another B5, but I think it won't happen unless we all can live in the same town because that's what made it really work. You know, whenever you're trying to get actors to sing anyway, <laughs> we need all the help we can get. And, and, and we're, missing, we're missing Andreas, but by, by, by putting us all in the same room and uh, being keeping really close tabs on us, Bill was able to turn out a, quote, halfway decent musical product uh, for a bunch of actors anyway. And, um, yeah, so I don't know whether there'll be another B5 album, but the new version which uh i you know i recommend you get has two new songs on it so uh hopefully that will you know wet your whistle a little bit <laughs> color it wetted yeah uh now it's an interesting question this came in from uh, one of the organizers ahead of time and, and this is a uh, 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 something i should have addressed earlier were you a fan of science fiction prior to tron no, I was not. Uh, you know, I, I, I was uh, because I had uh, both my parents were well educated and literary and, and wanted me to read. Uh, I was I was asked to uh, as part of my reading as a young man and an education. I read science fiction, but I was not necessarily a science fiction fan. Mm. Um, so my real introduction, I, and, I, and I say that openly, and I know the science fiction community kind of scratches their head and thinks, what the hell? <laughs> what? But really, I just, uh, you know, it, uh, it was, it's not the kind of literature I was interested in. It was not the kind of, I'm a, I'm a literary-based guy rather than a science-based uh, uh, mind, and so uh, I just uh, was not a science fiction fan, no. And I'm sorry to say, no. it, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I, I can honestly say, and it blows people away, that I've never seen a full episode of Babylon 5 or Star Trek or uh, I've seen the Star Wars movies, I guess. But um, You have a, a great uh, contribution that, that you made to, to something that I worked on a few years back. I was directing a production, this was in 2002, of uh, Hamlet which you co-produced, and among the many insights you shared with me, Peter, and, and it played a big part, I think, in the success of that production, was a warning not to let the actor who played Hamlet fall into a trap which you called excellent being. <laughs> yeah, right. What is that exactly, Peter, and why is it a danger to an actor in a role like Hamlet in particular? Well, you know, I think it, you can see it with a, with a lot of uh, the, uh, the commanders and the captains in the science fiction shows, uh, I mean, poor Bruce Boxleitner uh, had to had, had to grapple with excellent being, and um, I think there's a tendency sometimes for writers to, um, again, you know, it's it's a it's a writer who's not really pushing really hard on his work, that's trying to just turn out story. It's great to have somebody who is real good, you know, as I said, the good guy and the bad guy. Mm. Excellent being is somebody who has all the answers and uh, doesn't, doesn't make mistakes and doesn't have foibles and uh, doesn't trip and fall, doesn't get lost, doesn't get sad. Um, excellent, they're, they're excellent being and they're written that way. And it's a terrible thing for an actor. They're, very often they're put into lead roles, like Hamlet, that could happen too. But, you know, Captain Kirk is a perfect example, you know. You just, you just want our Bruce's role, you know, uh, Sinclair and Sheridan. Excellent people who have all the answers and are always doing everything right and uh, everybody can go to and are cool as cucumber under fire. It, 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 it's really, um, it's not real. It's completely made up. And we do it for the sake of literature, but it's a terrible trap for actors to get into. It's, it's, much, it's more interesting to approach the work from uh, the, our foibles and our, our weak points. Those contrasts and contradictions that you were talking about earlier, and it's more interesting, you mean, both for the actor and for the audience as well? Both, absolutely. Uh, as I said, it, it, it keeps the actor alive to come from that position because that's what we do in our lives. Let's face it. In our lives, what we do is, is deal with every day the challenges, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the tough stuff in life is what pushes it forward. 
You know, when, when it gets too easy, as everybody says, that's the time to start to get nervous. <laughs> if things get really too smooth, you just, just count on it. It's going to get bad pretty fast. So we deal with it and we go forward and we work hard. That's why all uh, success stories uh, when you, when you, when you, when you review the lives of, of uh, successful people so often, the early parts of their lives are just filled with uh, challenges and uh, things to overcome. And, and that's the way a character uh, works best, too. If we start the character from his weakest places, because those are the things that motivate us to move forward. Uh, I can't better explain it than, as I said, Rondo was in a corner. He was His back was to the wall. Now what was going to happen? Now where did he have to do? What was going to push him to get out of that corner? Or either that or he was just going to drink himself and die right in that corner. And that weakness is what um, humanizes and Everybody can relate to that, right, Scott? Yeah, absolutely. It's so true. We, we, we all understand that's what we do in our lives. How do you overcome uh, uh, friends letting you down, uh, loss of fortune, you know, fortunes come in force and go, uh, uh, deep sadness, uh, loss of, uh, of, 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 your, of parents and people you love, or, um, you know, how do you overcome those? How do you go forward? Disappointments in, in love, uh, in, in work. Um, that's what, what, what our end, what, what makes ends up being the energy of our lives. That's the thing that uh, pushes us to um, stand up and, and do something to make the world a better place. It's it's what drives, I would say, the core of uh, relayers in in any platform is uh, having been touched by uh, profound sadness and then needing to do something to get back into a feeling of having some kind of control. Uh, it's what I was saying about this. Uh, this you know the. To today's what we're doing here for Relay for Life, yeah, it's for it's for you know there's a there's a bigger cause, but the cause is uh, is really pushed forward by people, uh, individuals being touched by it and then reacting to that. And that's what's beautiful. That's why I why I accepted this offer today and feel so lucky to be a part of it. Somebody says, "Come on, we're going to together move against something." Mm. But, you know, it really does make a difference, Scott. And it uh, can bring together the strangest of bedfellows. Someone uh, is uh, mentioning that one of their favorite scenes between Jakar and Londo took place rather late in the series, and it was the two of them getting stuck in an elevator. <laughs> I don't know why people like that scene so much. <laughs> I guess because uh, Londo uh, is tortured so in it, and... Uh, and, and it also, uh, we made a decision, uh, and the word has gotten out about it, I guess. Uh, once um, Andreas and I got into that little box together on the set, we just decided we were going to um, not get off the script because we didn't do that. And neither of us were actors who wanted to improv very much. But we improv emotionally about how we would go about the script, and there was a level of, of Yes, improv even in the lines in that script. But uh, we just decided we were going to play that scene uh, for the laughs that it had in it and how funny it was that these two characters who couldn't uh, stand to be near each other were going to actually, are actually stuck together and would in fact maybe die together, but to find a, a way to play that with some humor. It was, uh, I, I guess that's why people loved it. It was a great scene to do. And it really, in a sense, uh, crystallized our working relationship, Andreas and I. Um, it wasn't uh, late in the series, Scott. It was relatively early. That's and right. Right. Uh, we both just stepped off together and said, great, we can get out here. I trust you. Uh, we had very different work methods or methodologies. But um, I think after that, we said uh, we can. it was really a, a real trust for both of us. We build trust with to say, yeah, I'll follow you. You follow me. Our, our time is uh, unfortunately coming fairly close to a, to an end. There's so much uh, we would love to get into talking about. I want to uh, step back from talking about specifically Babylon 5 and make mention of the fact, as you did earlier, you've been teaching acting for some years now. You're a great actor and a talented teacher as well. Can you talk about that a little bit, about teaching uh, something that I, I, I think really seems so mysterious I, to people both outside the craft and, frankly, to most of us within it as well most of the time? <laughs> 
Well, you know, all I have to say about it is, first of all, there's, uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's tremendously satisfying. The University of North Carolina and actually Frank Capra Jr. and then uh, a, a couple of people, Andy Belzer, who was the head of the theater department, and Todd Berliner, the head of the film study department, they, they asked me to be a part of it. And, of course, at first I said, I don't know anything about teaching. And I didn't know anything about teaching. I knew how to act because I had been doing that for, what, 30 years. But um, so the process was really about uh, finding out uh, how I could uh, deconstruct a process that I did without even thinking about it anymore. I always use the metaphor of I may have been a good race car driver, but I had no idea how the engine worked. So what I had to do is take the work process, break it apart, lay all the pieces down, study how they go together, and then put them back together and find a way that I could tell people how they went back together. So that's what I describe now. And I've actually gotten pretty good at that. I just, as they say, teach what I know and teach my own method. Uh, all actors uh, eventually come up with their own method, and that's, that's as, as, as it should be. And, you know, it's a, it's, it really, it's, it's a beautiful thing that has come into my life because um, I do it with a great deal of passion and connection to these people who are my students, and they, uh, they stay with me. And so I, you know, I hear about their trips to New York and their uh, good luck in Los Angeles, and, uh, their, and I watch their growth as actors. Um, and uh, it's, a, uh, it's a real gift that has come into my life. I love it. Well, I know you talk not just about acting, but you also uh, spend a good bit of time trying to help young actors better understand the business of, that they're walking into as well. Well, the, you know, the, I, f I feel like there's, especially in the community I'm in, uh, you know, there's n there are a lot of people who are giving a lot of misinformation about it, and people get into uh, auditioning situations or don't understand marketing and, and, and uh, you know, working really hard at something but going completely in the wrong direction. What's the old John Lennon uh, line about how can I go forward when I don't know which way I'm facing? So people are going in the absolutely wrong, <laughs> wrong direction to succeed uh, in if they want to succeed as an actor and working really hard at it, I want to say to them, wait a minute, whoops, you're going in the wrong direction. Turn around here. There's where you want to work. So I like to, uh, to help younger actors uh, point, hopefully point them in the right direction so that their good work, um, you know, really can, 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 you know, become something for them and turn a profit for them. Taking a couple of more questions out here of the audience. This one's coming from a couple of people. Actually, uh, a lot of people would, I think, be heartbroken if we didn't get to hear a little of Londo's unique voice. Uh, can you uh, <laughs> share a little bit uh, of that voice with us? And, like uh, say, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try, but there are fans come up to me now, and they're much better at doing Londo than I am. I'm so old, so I'm not a very good. So let me tell you, when I when I talked about reconstructing the outside of the character, uh, the truth, the story is, I used to for years walk around and say, "Mr. Gettaboldy, Mr. Gettaboldy, Mr. Gettaboldy," and that helped me get the. And certainly, you you if you're if you're looking for a mantra, you can always try Veer. <laughs> Uh, that helps. I always like saying the names of my uh, three wives, which are famine, pestilence, and death. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, uh, it's uh, it's. Not, I don't do it as well, uh, you know, because I've gotten older. So there are people who are you know can can nail it better than me. But I, when I think of the great lines that I have, those are the ones I like to quote, like famine, pestilence, or death, or. The famous uh, "Nibbled to Death by Cats." <laughs> um, uh, the the, uh, the 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 pilot. This when I told you I read the first pilot and I loved um, the story. You know him with his back to the wall. I loved when he said, "If I can recall it now, you know, my God, man, we've become a tourist attraction. <laughs> Nine to five, Earth time, selling trinkets." I just love that, you know. So he had a lot of great lines. I don't know that I can do Londo very well anymore, but there it is. I think you nailed it. Oh, good. Oh, that's great. Uh, so, so something almost Eastern European going on there, isn't there? You know what? Again, you talked about this, the, the synergy between, uh, you know, what pe they gave me little fangs. Remember they yes. had a little uh, tooth piece that I had to put, a mouthpiece that I had to put in with, like, little fangs. And when I looked at myself, I, I was definitely getting vampire vibes. So a little Transylvania didn't, and I had a Czechoslovakian uh, um, grandma, 
and I and I remembered her voice. So yeah, it is definitely Eastern European. I impose that. Well, science fiction, um, I guess, at its best, is a means for us to explore the important contemporary issues of our times, and we've talked about some of that already. It can also prepare us for ethical and moral challenges that we, we know are coming, but which we've not yet progressed technically far enough yet to be vulnerable to quite yet. In other words, Frankenstein forced us into uh, a conversation about ethics and science and medicine long before cloning was even conceivable. Uh, uh, Pete, do you think that's part of the appeal of uh, science fiction and Babylon 5 in particular? It, it, it's calling on us to grapple with ethical questions both of uh, today and those of tomorrow as well? Absolutely. Be, you know, the, the mere fact, I mean, that's why they call it science fiction too. It deals with, um, you know, uh, we, we just naturally are looking forward in uh, so often in science fiction or reflecting on the past and how it reflects on the future. But uh, it gives us an opportunity, really, you, you're right, to explore questions and think about uh, which people don't do enough. We're all dealing with our everyday stuff uh, so much. What's right on my plate in front of me today? What do I need to get done today and this week? And uh, science fiction offers a, a chance to, uh, to look further than that in our lives. It's a really needed thing that we don't do enough of anyway. So it's beautiful. Uh, another uh, question from uh, the audience. Uh, you did, you've done stage. We talked about movies and television, theater. Uh, mm -hmm. You've done radio as well, and you're also a published author. Um, question, uh, what is, do you have, uh, as an actor, do you have a preference for one of those mediums? Oh, no. They're, you know, they're, uh, they, uh, you know if, if anything, I feel closest. I loved, I was a, you know, mostly did most of my career as a television actor as opposed to a film actor or a stage actor, but they all have, you know, they, you get, I have great joy and I'm old enough now that I feel like I can do uh, any of them, but my heart is closest to TV acting. I love the speed of television acting. I love that you had to, uh, it's like quick draw. It's like quick fire, you know, you had to, to do it. Uh, at the end of the day, you really had no time to sit around and moan about whether it had gone well uh, or not, you needed to move on because the next day's work was coming right after it. Uh, like, you, you know, with films, sometimes you'll get several days doing the same project over and over and over, same scene for days. Um, certainly with stage, you'll get weeks to work on something. But I, I like this, how quick TV moved. And I felt that suited me. And I got to really love that. I love that, you know, do it, create it. And uh, like drawing, drawing in the sand, right? And the tide comes in, it's gone. Let's start a new, let's start tomorrow's work now. So I love TV. Starting tomorrow's work today. I like that. And um, uh, it certainly is, again, uh, what we're about in, as relayers in the virtual world, um, getting, uh, getting a jump on that uh, future, bringing that future uh, of a world without cancer closer and closer to being. Um, Pete, I, we're running just a little bit over time here. Uh, I want to ask you uh, if, if there's anything you want to uh, share with uh, the people here or with anybody listening uh, at, uh, at large, either about your work or about, uh, in particular, the cause uh, of Relay for Life. Much thanks to you, Scott, and uh, to the folks who put this together at Science Fiction Alliance, and thank you for you, and to the, the people who are listening, I just make an appeal again. Uh, join the cause. Be part of this, uh, what, we're, what, what uh, we're trying to do here today. Uh, it's such a worthwhile cause. Step up and uh, go to that kiosk or go to reallifeforlife.org slash second life and, uh, and be part of it. it. It'll validate our work here together. What, when It's us doing it together. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you. Peter Jurisic, star of stage and screen. And um, as you've, uh, if you've had a chance to hear Peter interviewed in the past, you'll already know the, the, what, um, uh, what, what you've learned here today. Uh, there's just not a better guy in the business. Uh, the, the heart as big as all outdoors uh, to match his talent and um, just a real, has been, as always, Peter, a great chance to, to talk with you about acting. I, I learned so much uh, from watching you work and from talking with you about the work. Um, thank you so much. I want to thank the IFT Sci-Fi Alliance, who organizes and runs this convention. Uh, major support from Ambrosia Coalition, LSI, Pax Phobos, the USS Dover, Araxis, Shiny Brand, Novatech and the Babylon 5 role play group 
and NS6, who provided, among other things, this marvelous theater we've been broadcasting from here today. Peter, thank you so much for all of this time, for your thoughts, and thank you for what you, what you do uh, to enrich our lives and to bring us closer to a future that we admire and love. Thank you, Scott, for inviting me. It's great to be a part of it. I love the fans. Thank you all. And you're getting lots of applause here in the local chat and uh, lots of uh, we love you, Peters, and uh, big thank yous uh, to you from everyone here uh, today. Thanks. I hope you have enjoyed this broadcast. My friends, I have certainly enjoyed being here with you. My name is Scott Simpson. I'm Xander Green here in Second Life, and I'm part of Fantasy Fair Radio. Uh, well, it is part of a Relay for Life, as is this convention. Thanks to every single one of you who made a donation here today. And I want to say a special thanks to Ariadne Fall for being such a marvelous host and for really making this um, a, a really a, a very special day for, for me and I know for Peter as well. Uh, my thanks to you, my friends. We'll give Ariadne a chance to switch the parcel music here back over as uh, we switch the automation back on for Fantasy Fair Radio. Thank you very much. Thank you for your donations to Relay for Life. Go Relay, keep it coming, and uh, keep reaching for the stars. <laughs>